Hey guys, it's Matthew Zachary, and I want to tell you about the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or the NCCN. The NCCN creates the treatment guidelines for doctors that help cancer patients lead better lives. But I want you to know that the NCCN also has guidelines for you. The patient guidelines were funded by the NCCN Foundation and were created just for people with cancer and their caregivers. They're free, they're easy to understand, and they're available right now for you, the patient and the caregiver. So go check them out at nccn.org slash empower. That's nccn.org slash empower. Hello, friends. Welcome back. I'm going to keep this real short. What a show. Dr. Danielle Carnival joins me live in studio. Who is she? Well, she is the White House Moonshot Coordinator, top of the chain, working at the White House with the Biden administration, effectively at the federal level, trying to fix much of what is broken. It's a real fanboy moment for me. I'm nerding out. I hope that comes across in our conversation. So let's get right to it. Enjoy the show. Daniel Carnival, thank you for coming on the show. Of course, thanks for having me. This was well coordinated. That's right. As coordinator yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I've, I've been wanting to have you on the show since you were appointed. I've been a huge fan of BCI, the Biden Cancer Initiative, since it was it began in 2016. And just as a, as a, a cancer survivor of 27 years now, I'm a fan of history. Mm-hmm. And I look at what it's taken to get to this point where these are good problems to have in launching these initiatives and trying to unify the country around something that I would hope is nonpartisan. No one should go broke from cancer or rare disease. And and this is, uh, I would say, an understated opportunity that could use a lot more, my dad would say, (laughs) zippy-wow to let the country know what's going on. But before we get started, let's talk about upstate New York. (laughs) Because I went to Binghamton and I was unaware that there was in upstate New York. <laughs> a common occurrence for people who grew up in New York City. Like north of Westchester could have been Canada for me. Yeah. I mean, it, in some ways it is. Right. Uh, but yeah, no, I grew up in uh, upstate New York, right outside of Albany and Troy, New York. So were you jealous of Schenectady for having Wegmans? <laughs> no, I'll, I'll leave all other comments about Schenectady off, but uh, no, not not jealous. Or how about Skinny Atlas? Yeah. All the Finger Lakes. Let's go for it. Cayuga, yeah. Seneca, <laughs> pick your poison. I, we were closest to Lake George, so I, I had a bias there. That's fantastic. So when did you get Wegmans? Because that's always the unifying conversation. I still don't think they have it. Are you was, serious? Yeah, there was there's an agreement in certain areas between families that the big families that own these big grocery store chains. And I think I forget which one it is, if it's the price chopper that's up there. But yeah, there's no there's no Wegmans. Well, if Kathy wins again, we'll have to put a ballot initiative in the state. <laughs> I, I think now that she's there, I think uh, uh, she'll feel uh, differently about that's it. That's true. That's true. Like it, it's a magnetic <laughs> brand. That's right. It's a fantastic brand. So when did you leave the upstate New York that is this area north of Westchester? Up in the, the woods in the, the mountains somewhere. Kind of uh, New York, eh? <laughs> yeah. For college. I left to go to Boston College. So I went went eastward towards the water um, and went to Boston College and studied biochemistry and other things. But So spoiler alert to my listeners, everyone knows me from my early beginnings as a concert pianist and film composer, but I originally went to Binghamton for biomedical engineering. Oh. Oh, interesting. I dropped that after Org 3. <laughs> Could not handle Organic Chemistry 3. Yeah. Well, I understand that. Yeah. Well, because um, you went through it. <laughs> I'm a weirdo whose brain loves that stuff. Uh, so Orgo, physics, calculus were my home and, and what I loved doing. And then I had to go to other classes and learn how to read and write. And, and that was harder for me. Were you the kind of kid that got like those home chemistry kits for Christmas? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. How much did you blow up? Like you had a little Dexter's lab going on? Yeah, I mean, I'm a pretty big rule follower, so no, nothing blew up that shouldn't have blown up. <laughs> Only intentional explosions. <laughs> That's right. That's, That's right. Fantastic. Parents, siblings? 
Yeah, I am uh, the youngest of five. Oh my goodness, uh, that is upstate New York. Yeah, well, three are step siblings. Okay, um, okay. but I grew up with them my whole life, uh, so they are they are full siblings in all ways, and an older brother, and four great parents, and uh, lots of sports. Lots of sports. Yeah. Well, you have lots of land. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> I actually was driving on the way here, saw a. Looked like a high school baseball team practicing in what looked like they had to like dig down into the ground to create a field in the middle of New York City. And I was remarking on like we just had like fields and full of baseball fields. Yeah, like I'm waiting for like the the parking garage stacked football, you know, fields that are happening soon. They they have uh, basketball ones in Washington, D.C. That are stacked up? Well, the the top level of a building, uh, they then turn into a basketball court and having two little boys myself who like to climb, there is no fence that could be high enough for me to want them to play basketball on the roof of a building. What are their names? Uh, Julian and Hugo. How old are they? Seven and four. Oh, God bless you. Mine are 12. I have twins. Oh, my gosh. How, so, how are the, the preteen years? So my universe in the oncology space, my kids are like the Truman Show. <laughs> I have thousands, tens of thousands of people have watched them grow up over the oh, last 12 years. Nice. Their birth was like the first Facebook post ever made in 2010. <laughs> And uh, everyone's aware, like, they've been on the show. They're part of our show. It, it's, yeah. it's a magic, uh, A, that they exist in the first place. <laughs> but B, that, that they just have, the, people have bared witness to their adolescence. They're 12 and a half now. Oh, my gosh. And it's a sentient, fun, pre-opinionated age. I love that that exists for five years from where I am because I was worried that that uh, that would quickly disappear. But yeah, seven and four feels like no, there's no more babies. There's no more toddlers. Like we have two kids. Right. And so we get to do fun stuff. And it's not always easy because they're seven and four and they're kids. But it's that like you're no longer tethered to a stroller or a nap. Right. Or they have to have specific food or right, right. anything. Like you can just go out into the world and get through a day and have them just be a part of it. Right. They're not like meatloafs. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> when they start cleaning up after themselves, you know you made it as a parent. Well, we they they both go to a Montessori school. Okay. And so uh, that like household taking care of things uh, is a huge part of it. And as a neuroscientist, it's really interesting because like... Yes, it's good to do and it's responsible and it's being a part of your community. And those are great lessons. But there's also something that happens in the sequencing of knowing how to polish a shoe Mm -hmm. or or, or shine a shoe or polish china um, or silver. Sorry, not china. Don't polish your china. Don't polish your china. (laughs) You heard it here, folks. your silver. Your brain actually starts to learn how to do sequences and steps and repeat that. And like, what do you need to do arithmetic? You need that same sequence. So there's some really cool neuroscience stuff there. Well, when, when it's a physical object, there's some more proprioception going on than just like learning math. But right. I can see how they counter, counteract each yeah. other. Yeah, and that's what they yeah. need at that age, right? Yeah. I mean, the four-year-old is most interested in things he can touch and feel and right. impact. And so it's just a really cool way. But sorry, I went, I went neuroscience geek on you for well, a while. Well, we're going to do neuroscience geek in, in, cool. in, a, in a minute anyway. <laughs> I mean, one more parenting thing. So they still love their plushies. Mm. They still have to be tucked in. Aww. They still have hugs before bed and hugs in the morning. And, you know, my most of my friends have had kids uh, before my wife and I had kids. So mm-hmm. their kids are like between 14 and college at this point where we're kind of lagging behind but learning the lessons at this point. But now I'm in a weird place where they used to be to talk to my friends and my colleagues who have kids younger than mine. Yeah. And I think when the plushies leave, it's all, it, that's, that's the end. Yeah. I uh, I want to keep those years for as long I know. as possible. Yeah, and I get to say now it goes fast, you know. But it also goes, you know, it, it you don't miss it. It's just different. Yeah, I mean, I feel that way about just where we are now, right? I actually loved having infants. I loved having babies. I don't miss it, <laughs> but right. but and and I I hope that I can say the same as you that that continues for every stage. So a default question I ask anyone on my show that's a doctor is, and I know the answer, but for the listener's sake, have you ever been on an airplane and someone said, is there a doctor in the house? And you say, me? Oh, wait, not me. <laughs> I have not done that as a card-carrying PhD. I, I know my place. Uh, <laughs> I will let the nurses, who are probably the best in that situation, yes. uh, given the diversity of skill sets exactly. that they have, I'll let them step in. So as a brain cancer survivor diagnosed in the 1990s, there really wasn't a lot to, you know, the idea of mental health was get over it. 
Mm. Right. There was no cancer survivorship. There was no long term follow up. It was just this nascent vacuum of appreciation that were people, not biological pieces of meat. Yeah. But I've seen such a wellspring in the academic centers and the research centers. And in fact, even Livestrong helped give birth to early forms of, you know, uh, psychosocial care. It's like, oh, you mean it's not over when it's over? <laughs> yeah. Mean, the postman rings many, many times. What's been your observation over the years as to the evolution of just public awareness of this, acknowledgement that it's a real thing, but the data and the science that's, that's really actually helping people today? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like it shouldn't be a novel concept to treat people as humans. Yep. Um, but wait, wait, that... <laughs> say that again? I'm sorry. <laughs> but it seems like we, and I think not to defend the, the field of, of medicine and research, I think because it was for decades just research, right? Like there, there weren't treatments that were for many cancers that were really extending and saving people's lives. And so that transition of like, oh, like we're not in a lab anymore. Right. <laughs> um, we're actually treating real human beings and, and having outcomes. And now they need continuation of care and, and handoff to back to their primary care physician. And what does that look like? And and how do we support them? And and oh, by the way, cancer doesn't happen in a vacuum. And and they have jobs and kids and spouses and like how does that like what how do those dynamics change? So I think um, it's been very patient driven, like the voices of patients and caregivers and family members has driven the system, I think, to really change the approach to how we take care of people. Um, we have these great tools, innovations, right? Like that, right. those are the science terms, right. but they don't matter if, if people aren't feeling well and going back to living their lives. That's the goal. Yeah. And, and the emergence of the, the functional nonprofit organizations, not the research nonprofit organizations right. that are human focused. Like, I mean, I started stupid cancer, but there were so many out there that were just emerging post live strong, which was not research. It started as just testicular, but they realized we could do so much more. And they got into like quality of life and long-term side effects. And they worked on the medication management with, I mean, so the breast cancer wars yielded <laughs> products that were like quality of life, you know, EMEND and Kytrol, antiemetics, all these things yeah. that were not about curing you, but keeping you in a less shitty <laughs> condition. Right. And that manifested all of these nonprofit organizations and communities, and, and today it's therapeutics and whatnot, that really did factor in the quality of your life was tantamount to the quality of care was tantamount to quality of life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I ran a, a, an ALS focus to- I was going to get to that getting too, back because we can share our nonprofit neuro. founder hats or That's whatever. That's right. Yeah. Running an ALS nonprofit. And like, it changed my perspective on everything. I mean, I've I've lost family members. I've lost a parent uh, to cancer. I felt like I understood what it meant like to be a fierce advocate on behalf of a family member or yourself. And then you drop in. I, in this case, dropped in as CE, inaugural CEO of this brand new patient driven nonprofit in ALS. And like, let me tell you, when no one has survived that disease, you can't compartmentalize what your what your focus on or what your priority is. Mm -hmm. It it is making sure that bills are paid, um, all of it, because it, it matters to patients. And also, like just again, channeling our our, our maybe our, our inner conflict of backstory as leadership of nonprofit <laughs> organizations. You know, the whole get off my lawn is an issue too. There's so much competition. One of the big lessons I learned from mentors in the mid two thousands was that. You know, yes, if we can all work together, our voices are louder, but the dogma, like if there was a macrame thing on the wall, it said that collaboration is the new competition. Mm -hmm. And I can assess that one of the big takeaways in the psychosocial space because of the young adult cancer movement was that it's not about what you have, it's about what you have in common. And yeah. how can you share those, I, we call it maybe life hacks, irrespective of your biology. The geography of your tumor didn't matter as much as how you learn from each other in that peer-to-peer -peer space yep. to move it forward. So before we go to break, do you have maybe any one or two really inspiring success stories in the ALS space? I mean, everyone's heard of the Ice Bucket Challenge and yeah. these huge social manifestations of goodness and appreciation. What that was was akin to the yellow wristband mm -hmm. you know, in, in oncology. In terms of things can actually change and get better. Can you point to one or two specific things? 
Yeah, two. One is a bill that was passed that we worked on from the organization I was in. And by the time it passed, I was at the White House. So it was really great to be able to organize the president's bill signing for a bill that meant so much to the community that I immediately just come from. Wow. Um, And because it had already passed Congress and he was signing it, there were no like restrictions. I wasn't lobbying for anything. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just there for the, the celebration. But what the bill does is we recognize that um, in rare disease, especially neuro, there's a lot of small biopharma that are really the pioneers driving action. And it's really hard for them to, in addition to paying for a trial, pay for expanded access. So the ability for people not in a trial to get access to a drug before it's approved. And so what this, one of the things this bill did was actually create a federal grant program that would fund at trial sites expanded access to people living with ALS so that some of these drugs that otherwise would be locked away until they went through the entire process, when there was nothing else on the table, patients deserved to get a chance at talking to their doctor and seeing if this was something that worked for them. So that was a huge win. And then the second is there was just a drug approval just this year just a couple weeks ago, actually. And so it has been decades since something um, has come through. And and I'm not going to assess whether this is like the breakthrough that's going to change all of ALS, but I hope it put a kind of a crack in the wall where there's now belief from drug companies, from research, from patients that we can attack this disease. We can make progress against this disease. You're turning this cockeyed pessimist and optimist. See? (laughs) <laughs> All right, we'll be right back with Daniel Carnival. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. Just channeling my inner history nerd. That my mom is a film historian. My dad is a history junkie. World War II history. We we did a documentary mm-hmm. last year called The Cancer Mavericks. It was an eight part narrative series, like akin to something you'd hear like on NPR, and it profiled the pioneers you never heard of that made things happen in the dogma of if you do it right, no one knows. Mm. And and that's such a fascinating way to think about advocacy. And whether it was forcing Nixon to drop the National Cancer Act or forcing the, um, the ADA or forcing the Orphan Drug Act or forcing the omnibus package for cancer survivorship or all these things that had to be forced, forcing the Affordable Care Act to happen. Yes, absolute respect for the Affordable Care Act. I really haven't observed probably since the Live Strong Young Adult heyday that led to ACA uh, another movement – another massive national movement for health policy to protect people from when bad things happen to you because bad things happen to you. Mm -hmm. And we're all born of our condition, right? The former vice president, President Biden, didn't ask for his son to die of brain cancer. That's right. And we often don't know what to do. How do I help? How do I make sure this doesn't happen to the next person? And I was just, as a brain cancer survivor myself, it hit home for me personally. I can't speak highly enough as to how he and Dr. Biden were so willing to learn and not knee-jerk just doing something on their own. Can you talk to what it was like to work with them in the wake of this this absolutely horrible tragedy with Bo to just start the Biden Cancer Initiative? What, what were the, the inner workings that got that off the ground? Yeah. So first it was the cancer moonshot and then we we did the Biden Cancer Initiative. But to speak to your question, they did take their time, right? Like the reason they wanted to get involved was because of this terrible tragedy with their son. 
but they also observed enough to know that there were still issues. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Turns out. Tell me more. <laughs> it was their first glimpse into, right, like how patients are able to move medical records from one hospital to another, like really or practical. Try to move medical That's records. right. <laughs> it was how uh, the president talks about um, Bo participating in kind of a trial of one. They were trying something kind of near the end when they when they didn't have any other tools left. And he often says, no one could tell me if anyone had ever done this. Like, how how is that possible? Mm-hmm. Um, so they had seen enough to understand that there were problems that they now with their with their personal experience could really take on. But they knew that they weren't experts. Right. And so which we, is a huge advantage to realize that, yeah, you're an expert in the fact that you have experienced healthcare in the worst possible way. That's right. But in terms of what do we do, how do we do it, yes. And so they did take their time to build out um, as part of the Cancer Moonshot in 2016 and then really as part of the Biden Cancer Initiative because when you're in, when you're vice president, it's kind of obvious where to start, right? Let's work with you Congress. Know a guy. <laughs> Let's get additional funding. <laughs> Let's bring together agencies and try to break down as many walls and increase urgency in how we work together to make progress. And, we're, oh, we're at the White House so we can be a stage that other external companies and organizations want to be highlighted by. And so let's leverage that to get everyone to join this. So that was a little bit more obvious. But especially when we started the Biden Cancer Initiative, their nonprofit after we left office, there's a lot of things you can do on the nonprofit side. And so... Are there? (laughs) Tell me more. (laughs) No, she's right. She's listeners. She's absolutely right. And so, I mean, we could have raised hundreds of millions of dollars and gone the research route. We could have gone straight advocacy. And instead, again, because of uniquely, it was what unique powers, superpowers, do they have based on who they are? Um, and we very much decided to do a lot like we did in the White House. Let's use, our, let's use the Biden Cancer Initiative as a platform. Let's put out some really solid goals that were informed by an expert board and advisory committees of every name across the country involved in in cancer, the fight against cancer. And let's put out some goals and then have a summit and have announcement events and use their voice and and stage to really move the needle. Uh, So that's kind of where we where we ended up on that. And it was fascinating. Again, I was I was kind of on the outside of this running. I was privileged enough to be running the largest young adult cancer organization in the country. And we were enamored. A, once ACA passed, we're like, pre-existing edition, we're all screwed up now. This is fantastic. Not that we're screwed <laughs> up, but that we will be less screwed potentially in the long game. Yep. And even the pediatric cancer world, which is largely part of stupid cancer, their parents were our age and they were aging into this community. And it wasn't about commonalities because long-term pediatric outcomes are, and, and quality of life are vastly different in many cases than just getting it in your 20s and 30s. But knowing that there was a, something you could really point to was just galvanizing. Mm-hmm. And it, it was this massively unifying understanding between 2012 and 2016, what was really possible from activists and just ordinary citizens. So full credit to Moonshot 1.0 <laughs> to BCI, and now you're back. Moonshot 2.0. Really we, fascinating. There's a lot of media talking points. What are the top three things that ordinary Jane and Joe could get a sense of that sum up what we hope happens because of this? Yeah. So one, we reignited, is how we talk about it, reignited the Cancer Moonshot in February of this year and set out new goals, right? So let's me- let's make sure that we're we're marching again all in the same direction towards things that'll be really impactful. Let's cut the death rate from cancer by 50% over the next 25 years and let's improve the lives, improve the experience of people living with uh, and surviving cancer, their caregivers and families, right? Quantifiable and human. Uh, I think all of our work should should cover both of those you things. You keep using these words. I don't think they mean what you think they mean. <laughs> and I think the takeaway is we're bringing all of government together. And that means, yes, we're going to really drive research and, and innovation. We need new ways to prevent, detect, and treat cancer if we're going to hope to reach either of those goals. But the power of having, say, not just the Department of Health and Human Services, but the Department of Labor at the table, talking about how to protect workers, 
from harmful substances and making sure that workers know people know their rights when they're facing a cancer diagnosis of if they're allowed time off. Right. Like really the human again, the human side, the personal side that matters in addition to new ways to prevent, detect and treat cancer. Let's make sure more people have the tools that already exist and that we are supporting and and thinking about them. So that means a couple of really tangible things. The Inflation Reduction Act won't get into the details, but seniors, Medicare beneficiaries will now not pay more than $2,000 out of pocket per year, including people living with cancer, right? Like that is a tangible life-changing thing for those people. So we're really focused on, like I said, driving the innovation, but making sure that we're taking steps that matter now to people facing this disease. Well, I mean, it's easy to just discard them as people. They're voters. These are people that in in this ideal idea that healthcare is something that really can very easily be politicized. But if you talk Mm -hmm. to the average person and say, this is not going to happen to you anymore, they should be proud of that. That's right. And how do you explain that to them as a whole of the story? (laughs) I mean, I, I look at when Andy von Eschenbach took over the NCI and started the Director's Consumer Liaison Group, I'm dating myself way back in the mid 2000s. I've heard of it. Yeah, it was a. Yeah, you might have heard of it, right? <laughs> this whole thing here, the NCI, maybe. And they changed their mission. It was very subtle. They changed their mission, which was in 1971, let's cure cancer, to let's eliminate death and suffering due to cancer. Mm-hmm. And everyone lost their minds. Like, how dare you not want to cure cancer? And no, no, stop, breathe. It's a different way to think about what cure means. That's right. And I'm, I pro- was on a panel, I think. We talked about how cancer is just evolutionary biology gone wrong. You can't get rid of it. It's there. How do you control it? And, oh, I get it now. You can't really get rid of it. It's like getting rid of, like, you know, skin tags. You can't. They're going to be there for <laughs> to cure skin tags. And um, just this fundamental pivot of protecting consumers Federal protections, right? The EPA. In its heyday, the EPA was a phenomenal federal protection. I I mean, again, outside of maybe ACA, when was the last time there was a true federal protection that helped Americans get maybe less screwed by health care? By health care, that's a good question. Coverage, benefits, insurance, all those things. Yeah, I was going to actually go with your EPA lead because I don't want it to be overlooked that the bipartisan infrastructure law wasn't just about building infrastructure. It was about fixing infrastructure to protect people. Right. So there is a cancer prevention story uh, that is a huge part of the work that the EPA is doing in cleaning up water pipes and and Superfund sites and and making sure that we earlier this year, they put out a new regulation to get rid of the last remaining asbestos, right? These are steps that are bipartisan, that were in the bipartisan infrastructure law that make a difference uh, in in protecting people from these harmful chemicals. And in that, I believe, was more broadband access, right? That's absolutely right. I mean, that can't can't be understated either. I mean, if the pandemic taught us anything, besides the AMA losing their shit that pharmacists were prescribing vaccinations, (laughs) but which is, that's the other podcast (laughs) tomorrow, is that you can't have telehealth if people don't have the right internet for it. That's something you would actually point to. If you can have this whole idea of access to care, it's a nice, those are nice syllables, right? We've been saying that for 40 years. But if you really do not have a way to get in touch with a medical professional at any point, that's bad. And we saw a great impact of telehealth, including in cancer care, but it didn't solve equity. And so you're right. right. Having more broadband, actually, the National Cancer Institute just launched four centers of excellence to really study in different areas of care how telehealth can be most effectively used. So yes, we don't want it. We want to maintain it. We want we want that tool to continue to exist for people. It was decreased travel burden and cost burden and increased access and hopefully more so with, with additional broadband. But We want to make sure we're using the best parts of it and looking at everything from early detection through survivorship and and continuation of care, how to really use telehealth effectively. So one of the other initiatives I was reading about, because I was in Boston, as you know, for the announcement, which is fantastic privilege to be there, is the idea of, (laughs) I just laugh at this, sharing cancer data. Yeah. Right. And cancer data, we don't have to get into those weeds now, but the idea of sharing 
just reminds me of like kindergarten, right? I want to share. This is my mat. It's my rug time, right? What it, what's it going to, is, I don't know. I can't even frame the question. Like, what does it mean? What does it take? How do you actually get people to align on the idea of sharing for the benefit of all of us? Yeah, I mean, there is a uh, moral reason to do so, and and in increasing ways, a a kind of contractual obligation if you're getting federal funds to do so. Yes, but there's also a, a scientific reason, right? Like the more we are learning, we understand that cancers are more unique, and ra- maybe even more of them are turning out to be rare once we really dig into what that breast cancer type subtype is. And so I th- hope that drives the process of sharing even more so, because you can be a, a breast cancer doctor anywhere in the country, and, and you saw enough people with breast cancer to do your own research. But you might now not see enough people with a specific subtype where you have to start collaborating in new ways um, and sharing data sets in new ways so that we actually can make progress faster. One more quick break, and we'll be right back to talk about my favorite syllables, biomarkers. I might have been the only one in Boston that was there that witnessed one small little Easter egg in his speech. He pluralized the word cancer. I've never heard anyone at a federal level, even a medical, no no one's ever pluralized it. And I'm sure that was intentional. Whoever wrote that speech, kudos to them. You wrote that speech? Uh, well, the speech writer wrote the speech, but but we work collaboratively so that it it really reflects what the substance is. I mean, like like again, I was probably the only person in the country that that read into that that was pluralized, and I want to I want to just own that. Let's all own that. There's more than one. Let's cure one cancer that's in everybody's body. Finally, it's a national narrative everyone can work from that there are 200 billion different types of genetic weirdness in your body and they can all go wrong at a moment's notice. I was diagnosed 27 years ago, there were four drugs. Now there's 40 billion drugs, right? Yeah. So I wanna talk more about how you're gonna downstream to the ordinary, again, the, the ordinary American through diagnostics, through market access, the, these jargony terms that no one needs to understand Cancer prevention used to be like diet, exercise, you know, take care of yourself. But I feel like now there's a blood test where you don't have to do that, but it kind of helps to do that. Are we really looking at a shift in helping people just maybe not get it in the first place? I think we already have a powerful tool to do that in colonoscopies, right? Like that is our best example. And I hope people hear it loud and clear, right? Like Anyone who's a, I I come from a family where there's been too many cancer deaths and too much cancer. So people, I get and understand that people are afraid to go to screening sometimes. Well, no one wants the answer. Because you don't want the answer. And if you can live your life without that answer for as long as possible, I I, I understand that that feeling. But we're at a totally different place. Mm -hmm. We have ways to cure some cancers. Yes. We have ways to effectively treat and put into long-term remission other cancers or turn some into chronic conditions that we can manage and and you can get back to your life. And so- Gleevec. mm -hmm. Remember Gleevec? It was like the first cancer you just like put into abeyance. Like, what's that like? That was crazy. And then Gardasil, like just don't get cervical cancer or anal cancer or like, this is, these are things you could point to. Right, but in, in the non-solid tumor space too, like hematologically, there are now new things you can actually point to that tie into this whole, what is the new prevention? And I hope that what all of this does is m- takes the power away from the word cancer mm-hmm. because we can actually do something about many, many of these. There's too many that we can't do anything about and we need to get back into the lab and work on childhood cancers and rare cancers and brain tumors and, and all sorts of things um, because in metastatic breast cancer, right? We can take the power out of that word cancer. And I want people, I want all of us to start to change that, our attitude towards screening and early detection and prevention because there is, there, we can take an active role in that and there's outcomes 
that get you back to living your life. And so that's a huge part of what we're what we're trying to focus on. I've always been a um, maybe a, a conscious objector of preventing cancer because you really can't. But now you might be able to. It, 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 it took like we're all this is all resulting of the human genome project, right? All of this is begotten. Is that a word? I just made a word up. <laughs> it resulted of understanding that our DNA it may or may not be our destiny for better or for worse. Yeah, and I think there's highly technical ways to prevent cancer, right? There's people living with Lynch syndrome that increases their likelihood of getting cancer way beyond uh, the general population. And they're testing a vaccine that could actually prevent, replace the issue that uh, people with Lynch syndrome have in their cells that could turn them back into maybe normal risk population. So there's, there's cool science ways to do prevention, but there's also really basic ways to do prevention. We know what uh, smoking tobacco does. Uh, we know what uh, nutrition has an impact. We know about environmental exposures. So I think what you're going to see from us is a balance of having a gadget or a widget or a tool in, in the answer to taking on this problem of, of decreasing death by cancer, but also really simple things about how we live our lives and how we as a society think about our health. Those are way harder, uh, but we're, we're willing to take it on. So are we looking at a future where basically you go to your local pharmacy and unlike a 23andMe kit, there's like a don't get cancer kit? That'd be really interesting. I think talking about the multi-cancer kind of blood test that you're that you um, had brought up, that would change the game. We are really excited about the possibility of those technologies. I think there's more work to do to really understand the impact that they have on outcomes. There's policy work to do to make sure now you go in and get a blood test that says you might have cancer in this location. What do the next steps look like? And are they reimbursed? Right. Like we have some some figuring out to do to really understand and take advantage of the promise of those technologies. But it would change everything. Well, the patient advocate cynic would always say, what good is it if you can't get to it or pay for it? That's right. And that's something that these federal protections are hoping to solve for Mm -hmm. these incentives. So let's wrap up for the listeners, for me, for my cronies, my network. What role? Can patient advocate leaders, nonprofit executives, just ordinary activists that want to learn to do something that isn't just raising money for research, what can we do? Is there a call to action? What is it? Whitehouse.gov slash moonshot? What's the website? Whitehouse.gov slash cancer moonshot. I was close. You, you had it. I was so close. So we go there. How are we activated? What can ordinary citizens do? Just in, in their hometowns, at their churches, at their synagogue, what can we do yeah. to support this? A couple of things. So one, I talked a lot about what we're doing as government. And so when the president said, I need all hands on deck, we took that seriously and, and did that across agencies. But he very clearly said everyone. We need scientists to bring their best ideas. We need companies to innovate and collaborate. We need patients and caregivers and survivors to continue to share their expertise They became experts in the disease that they were facing, and they have a lot of knowledge to contribute to this. So at whitehouse.gov slash cancer moonshot, there's a couple things. There's share your story. We know that the power of human experience moves mountains in Washington, D.C. and and everywhere else. And so people really sharing their story, their experience, and what they think needs to happen is a huge part of it. But then there's a section for individuals, companies, nonprofits, academic institutions to put forward their ideas. What should we be prioritizing? What should we be focused on? We think we have a good idea on cancer screening and understanding and eliminating toxic exposure and decreasing the impact of preventable cancers and driving innovation and supporting uh, patients and caregivers. But there's a lot of other ideas out there and we are, we're not the only ones that have them. So people can send their idea. And then the third piece, which is really important is the Cancer Moonshot is a platform to highlight great work, not just from the federal government. And so anyone can put forward what new actions or collaborations they want to do as part of this. Do they want to have a lemonade stand to raise money for their neighbor down the street? We want to know about that. I would argue the next great consumer health revolution is upon us. One last question. Actually, not a question. Jerry Springer's final thought. (laughs) (laughs) I'll bring back the the early 90s here. I can assure you and the White House and the president that 
there are hundreds of cancer organizations in this country that need leadership. They need governing oversight. They need stewardship on what they can do collectively. And I turn to the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship for really leading the fray when ACA was going through its loopholes yeah. to get that done. We're at the ready. We are sitting here waiting to be told what to do, how to do it, and where to be when we need to be somewhere. So on behalf of, I think I, as the Kevin Bacon of oncology, I could pretty much say <laughs> on behalf of this universe, we are here to do great things with the administration. That is great to hear. We're gonna we're gonna all be needed. So that that is really important. Dr. Daniel Carnival is the White House Cancer Moonshot Coordinator at the White House. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Out of Patience with Matthew Zachary is an off-script health production. The executive producers are Matthew Zachary and Andrew McDowell. Our senior producer is Sarah Rosa Davies. It's mixed and edited by Sarah Rosa Davies and Kyle Moore. Special thanks to Brianna Seely for added support. If you like the show, ratings and reviews are always welcome. Leave us a message anytime at 855-AUDIO-66. That's 855-AUDIO-66 to share your healthcare shitness with us. And we might just play them on the air on a future episode. For more information about this show and Offscript Health, visit offscript.com. That's offscript, no T, dot com.